I am delighted to welcome Stephen Shang, the CEO and co-founder of Falcon Structures, to the Banking on Community podcast today. Falcon Structures is a leading manufacturer of shipping container-based structures, and under Shang's guidance, they have developed safe and efficient structures for various industries in need of functional space, with an impressive track record of producing over 1 million square feet of container structures Falcon has proven to be a game changer in this space. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Been a while, you and I getting together. Yeah. I've been watching you from afar for years. We met, gosh, 2008, 2010, probably, right. through Entrepreneurs Organization here in Austin, yeah. Austin Texas. 10, 15 years. I know. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we're going to be older. We all thought so. you were crazy. <laughs> I that still am. <laughs> we, yeah. Well, that, okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, welcome again. Thanks for coming. We're Thank glad you. to have you here. And it's always a pleasure to see you. Great and man, here. have you been busy oh, it's been and successful. Time. And I can't wait for our listeners to hear more about your story, which I find fascinating. And uh, you're going to walk us through that today. So thank you for agreeing to be here. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit more about the creation of Falcon Structures, um, kind of the early days of what you thought, and then how that has led you to become one of the leaders or the leading manufacturer of shipping container-based structures. And sure. and people are going to want to know, well, what exactly is a shipping container-based structure? So we'll probably want to get into that a little bit too. Okay. But jump right in and tell us a little bit about your backstory. Yeah. So when I think back 20 years to 2003, 2002, when we were first coming up with this business plan, back then nobody knew what storage containers were, right? And, and the company we called a Falcon Storage back then – and, you know, there was always the joke, you're, you're in storage containers, you're doing Tupperware, like, what are you trying to sell me kind of thing? <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. Have you seen that movie with, you know, Will Smith before he kind of punched Chris Rock? But that movie where the robots are all fighting and, uh -huh. and you know, they have that big backdrop. They're fighting in shipping containers and people go, oh, okay. Oh, I that. Know. Yeah, yeah, I know what that is. And so back then in 2003, we were just renting storage containers. We were buying used shipping containers, renting them out to construction sites for portable storage for 100 bucks a month kind of thing. But what we did was we listened to the marketplace, right? We really listened to our customers and customers would constantly be asking us, hey, could you build me a job site office out of this? Can you build me a hunting cabin out of this? Could you build me a swimming pool out of these things? And over time, we were listening to enough customers that it's like, hey, there might be a business opportunity here to not just rent out storage containers, but to really start modifying shipping containers. And we got our big break in like 2008, 2009 during the Great Recession, where the military asked us to build uh, simulated villages, schools, mosques, entire cities out of containers for our troops to train in. And we got really good at it. We got to build a whole lot of stuff. And at the end of that that period, uh, when sequestration kicked in, Brian and I looked at it, and Brian's my co-founder, Brian and I looked at each other like, are, are you having fun doing this building things? And it's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So we decided to go all in on manufacturing these Manufacturing. So let me go back real quick though. Yeah. So but how did you stumble on the concept of storage rental? Like, oh, yeah. we, but like, did you have a construction background? Like, how did you, how did you like come up with this idea? Entrepreneurs come up with the craziest ideas. And, and I always love to know, well, yeah, well, how did you wake up one day and go, I'm going to lease used shipping containers to, yeah. Like, how did you stumble into that? Well, um, part of it was desperation. Right. Coming out of 2001, 2002, I was living in San Francisco. I went to UT, so I'm not native Californian. Got it. But was chasing the dot-com gold out there. And, you know, the crash had happened. I was just so sick of selling lightning out of a bottle. That's what it felt like. Yeah. We were selling these ideas, but there wasn't really any tangible product. It's like, look, I want to come up with something that you can see, you can feel, you can kick and hurt your foot when you kick it kind of thing. Yeah. And there was this this thing where it's like all these shipping containers were piled up in the ports and we were importing a lot more in the U.S. than we were exporting. It's like, look, somebody's got to do something with these shipping containers. And so we started looking into that industry. That's interesting. Like you just read about shipping containers. Yeah. You, yeah. It's not like you were doing a dot com that had no. anything to do with shipping containers. <laughs> not at all. That's so crazy. I love these stories about how entrepreneurs can take these just abstract, simple ideas and then look at you now. Yeah, right. And it's so amazing. <laughs> there was a company back then named Mobile Mini. Mm -hmm. public, I remember. Publicly traded company. And you, when you read their annual reports, they had these They're still around, right? margins. Yeah, they got bought by William Scottsman. Okay. But they had like 45% EBITDA margins. It was crazy. It's like, wow, these guys are printing money. 
But when we looked at what they were doing, it's like, boy, they're this big national company. We can do it better locally. And so actually our first ad campaign, we sent out this fax blast back when we had faxes. Fax machines. <laughs> and it said, why go mini when everything else is bigger in Texas? Oh my goodness. And they got so mad at us. They sent us all these letters like cease and desist. Stop that. You can't, you can't use our name. That. Yeah. But it was our start. Oh my gosh. What a great story. Well, by looking at the Falcon Structures portfolio, you know, your team has worked on a range of products. Um, you briefly touched on the work you do for the military. Um, some of those are also include waiting rooms and to indoor farms. And what what are some of the projects that you've done that have stuck out to you the most? You know, they all kind of stick out to me just they, because they're all just they're so all much unique. Fun. Yeah. They're all very unique, but there's a common thread in all of them. Like what we've tried to do is to give kind of the customer what they need by drawing on our design library, right? So we're not reinventing the wheel every time. We're taking all the things we've learned in the last 20 years and putting it all together in the mix and, and making them. So you're design build. It's you're not just build. You're, That's right. You're design build now. Yeah, we we definitely you know, you really have gone process. deep then. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm thinking of like a project we just won an award for uh, in Houston mm -hmm. during the pandemic. The the YMCA wanted to do more outdoor gyms, so we used shipping containers to build a entire workout facility using shipping containers for their um, spring location. So when you drive up to it, you see the YMCA, you see the big tower, which is a 40 foot container erected vertically with a big Y on top of it. And then you open up the, the roll up doors and you got free weights, you got exercise bikes, you get all kinds of things. And bathrooms. people are doing these because there's a, a quicker path to completion and open date, or is it because they can just throw it away and start all over? What's What motivates someone to... To, to, to do these projects with these containers versus hiring a builder and building traditional brick and mortar? Yeah, so the big trend that we're writing on right now is, is the modular trend, right? So modular means if you look at construction as an industry, it's gained maybe 6% in productivity in the last 60 years. 6%, not per year, but over the last 60 years. Not very good. Not very good. <laughs> and so you wonder, you know, why haven't they they've been so slow to adopt technology? And construction is being done the same way that it was, you know, 500 years ago. Why build it on site when you can build it in a factory? Everything else we do is being built in factories. You wouldn't take an iPhone kit home and build an iPhone. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't kind of get all the parts for your car and build it in your driveway. Why would you build your home at a site, Right. So you can build it in a factory, and because you build it in a factory, you can get it there so that it's a parallel process. You can do all your site prep, site development, and all that stuff, and build the structure at the same time. So theoretically, you can build it two times faster than traditional construction. Interesting. And so that's the big trend we're writing. You know, if you look in the U.S., the percent market share of construction that's modular is at 6%. That's it. Right. And you're a lot of room to grow. A lot of room to grow. And that's up from like two percent. So it's five years it's ago. more efficient and gets you to market quicker. Yes. It's not so much that people view it as a disposable way to build. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. very, it's like, very permanent. It's very permanent. It'll Even probably last longer than a lot of wood structures. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Very cool story. Okay. So I'm I'm sure we're gonna get into a lot of questions. One one question before we move on from this topic is what what's the future look like? Like what, where do you see this? Like you've done waiting rooms, indoor farms, you've done these training mock-ups for the military. What, what, it's, the sky's the limit almost. What, what's out there that you haven't done that you think you might end up seeing yourselves do? So one of the things that we see about this industry is really unique in the sense that the ideas come to us. It's not like we have a big R&D department that's thinking up, oh, how do we use containers? Every time I think I've thought of everything. Some someone... customer comes walking in the door and says, yeah. hey, can you do this? Exactly. It, it's it's like the, the, there's a book that my wife bought for my kids. It's called, I think it's like, it's not just a box. It's about this little rabbit who gets one of these Amazon refrigerator boxes. And all of a sudden, it's a race car. It's a burning inferno. True. Right? It's a fire engine. Yeah. And that's what I get to do every day. I play with these big boxes. I cut holes in them and I turn them into things. And so in the last few years, we've seen so many new things come to fruition as solar has gained ground. We're building more solar containers, wastewater treatment containers for the crumbling wastewater treatment um, infrastructure we have in our country. Wow. So, I mean, there's just so many different applications for it. 
and it's I amazing. Think it's because it's a big box. Yeah. Right. And you can do a lot of things with a big box. Yeah. I know people that have bought them to build hunting lodges. Yeah. They're the hunting cabin. That's exactly right. You have a lot of these out in the middle of nowhere. For There's a lot cabins. of hunting cabins in Texas. <laughs> there are quite a few, right? Yeah. It'd be a decent market if they had any money to spend. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, so here at Keystone Bank, we like to examine the impact we have on our communities. That's one of our core values is community. And, and I know that's the same for you. Um, how do you see your work at Falcon Structures impacting communities around the world, here in Austin and around the world? Um, and, and maybe two-part question to that is, how do you see Falcon Structures solving society's most pressing challenges from, from renewable energy to affordable housing? That's sure. a mouthful, but but hopefully you get the gist of yeah. The question. So tell me a little bit about making? your, yeah, what difference are you making? And tell us about the, your community as you view it. Sure. So, you know, I think community, um, if we look in the marketplace, right, the community is definitely our customers, but it's also our suppliers. And if you look at the first part of our mission statement, it's to build a better world. And how do we build that better world? Well, we do take on some of society's most pressing problems, like you're talking about. Affordable housing, we think that is something that can be solved by modular use or, or modular construction techniques. I don't see how I can't. Yeah. Like that's got to be like within your grasp. Oh, and, and we're, we're, we're grabbing it right now, right? We should have a few apartments come online in the next year where it's using containers in a modular fashion to build affordable housing faster and cheaper than traditional construction can. If you think about uh, the, the, the food islands or the, the food deserts that are out there, right? Yeah. Building an indoor farm using a container, you can grow fresh produce in areas that would be otherwise not starved. a chance. Exactly. Right. That's fascinating. So solving you those are problems. solving some amazing human problems. Yeah, and the renewable energy. I mean, the solar industry. They've been embracing our containers for not just use of the solar panels, but the storage, the the, the battery storage that's necessary to really power that industry. So we're building solutions for that. So amazing. there's just a lot of different applications in the marketplace. How do you get to it all? <laughs> just you just hire great people. You got to hire great people. That's right. You got to hire. You figured out how to focus. do that. You know, I'm not that good at it, <laughs> but I have people that are good at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, isn't yeah. that a theme with entrepreneurs? Oh yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But you get out of their way at this point. You have to get. Like out you out wouldn't of the way. be. You wouldn't be doing what you're doing. <laughs> but you know, the, the the other part I think people gloss over as far as like how do we how do we serve our community right. It, it, it's more inward facing, meaning how do you serve your employees? And, and you're touching on that with the people comment. And, and, you know, we've got about 90 employees right now. And if you came out, we're not your typical Austin company, right? No. We've got welders, we've got carpenters, we're dirty, we're in a dusty environment. I mean, it's, it's just, it's really blue collar. But for me, being able to connect with those guys every day, right, and really show them what does it mean to be, and I have this theme called the love-based leader. What does it mean to be a love-based leader for these people? And to show them that their work really matters. That's a different and way to And that they matter community. and that they're valuable <sighs> they're and so valued. Valuable. Yeah. 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 And that's Great philosophy. No Wonderful philosophy. No yeah. wonder you're successful. <laughs> well, some people would argue that you need to have fear-based leadership, right? But I, I, I no chance. is better. That's yeah. bad. It is. That's it is. awful. <laughs> we all can... Lose our temper every now and then, but yeah, <laughs> get excited or fired up every now and then. But as entrepreneurs, especially, right? You can't. You got to take care of your, your your peeps. You got to take care of your people. Well, so I I applaud you for the affordable housing slash housing. Mm. Uh, one of my big pet peeves is this whole idea that you know we've seen unfold right in front of our eyes in Austin and around the country. It's just the the financing structures and the capital structures that are available to build apartment complexes mm -hmm. are so perfected and the investors that buy them. And I mean, it's just like, and we just keep building apartment after apartment. And before you know it, we're going to have half our community living in apartments and not owning and not having like a differentiated experience from the next person right. that lives in the apartment across the street from them. And I just find it fascinating. I've always wondered, like, could people eventually own their own apartment? Like, could they eventually buy a piece of a container yeah. or a container community that or just rent something that's completely unique and different. Well, if you think about it, like we, we, we've got this internal theory we call it the great migration of people. Yeah. Right. So 200 years ago, you and I would be born in a village. We'd hang out together, you know, meet the love of our, of our life there, get married, have kids, 
and then die, right? Mm -hmm. We'd never move. We'd be in that village. But if you look at people today, we're moving all the time. Yeah. So why are our building structures being designed in such a way that they are permanent? Yeah. Why can't we design a more mobile kind of building philosophy so that if you move from Austin to, you know, El Paso, that you can actually take your home with well, you? We used to have them called mobile homes and right. they became <laughs> really... Exactly. Like really low class. Low but, class. But if you could take your home with you, have this concept of nomadic movement, then why not, right? So own the home that you go to. And so, I mean, there's a huge global infrastructure that has to be developed for that. But that's the way people are moving. Why can't our And you're driving some of that too? by We're coming up to. with these really great ideas to take a metal box. And, yeah. and, and, and it's my understanding that you don't take any metal box. No. Like... You get them when they've had one trip across the ocean. That's right. That's right. Right? Yes. You don't get them when they've gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, we can get them. If a customer but you don't like those. Them. We don't like those as much. Those either. are a little used. <laughs> and they're hard to bang out all the And dents. they're hard to bang all the dents out. <laughs> yes. That's crazy. So you pick them up and who are your suppliers of that? Or is that a U.S.-based company or is it a, is it a non-U.S.-based company? So we have a huge supply chain of these things, right? Okay, so you're talking to everybody that has access to them, not just one. Yeah. 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 So when, when COVID hit, we fortunately had some cash on our balance sheet. And I told my board, I'm like, hey, look, we're buying up every container we can find because there's going to be a shortage of these things. How many containers are there in the world? There are, I believe at last count, 16 million in circulation. That's phenomenal. Isn't it though? I that mean, you know that, that, but I guess you should know that if you're in the industry that you're in. But yes, the number itself is huge. Yeah. You just watch some of these cargo ships. I don't know if you've gone to the port and watched these things. They're just beautiful and amazing. They're fascinating, aren't they? Yeah. And that's just the stuff you can see above the rails, right? That's right. Because the whole all the way below, the all of the bottom of the thing is filled too, right? Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah. They, they, the, was it the suit? Was which which canal did they oh the suez the yeah. suez it was the suez canal blockage i still think that had that caused the problem oh, and we've never recovered from it that was like <laughs> that was the supply that was, chain that problem. was the, that was the supply chain problem it had nothing to do with COVID. it has to do with the wrecked ship of the suez did you ever see pictures of the scale of how big that ship really it was, was enormous oh man it was a monster note to self don't ever let that happen again right <laughs> that's right that's right stop yeah we'll be <laughs> Go back into the dark ages again with our supply <laughs> chain. Right. My goodness. Well, that's great. So um, with the changing regulatory environment, and I don't know, we're seeing it in our industry, mm -hmm. you know, kind of pendulum swings back and forth, depending on who's in power. I think it just swings. It just swings. <laughs> it just gets more and more. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It never lasts. But with the changing regulatory environment, how do you see the use of shipping structures and building structures evolving in the future. And I know we talked a little bit about that earlier. Yeah. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but maybe specifically, is there other evolutions of it out there even that that you're thinking about with your board? Sure. Yeah. So in 2015, one of the things when we were doing our SWOT analysis, right, planning for every year, we looked at it and we said, you know, one of these threats is starting to come up more and more is that building code officials don't like containers. And the question is why, right? And so we really got involved with the Modular Building Institute. And we started this entire nationwide effort called the Container Task Force through the Modular Building Institute on how do we really get building code officials to Not understand smart. containers. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And so we partnered up with ICC, the International Code Council. And through that effort, we came up with, you know, uh, guidelines for building code officials. But we actually got um, the um, containers put into the 21, 2021 building code. So what's happened is all of a sudden you have a way to actually permit and build legal container structures. And so right now we're at the very beginning of that. And so we're going to see container-based structures really explode because now there's a way to permit them. And they don't is have to that, fly under the is radar. that in Austin or is that nationally? Oh, that's national. So it's a national initiative that not you don't have to go to every locality. It's now covered by this work that you've done with ICC and others. Exactly. That's fantastic. Exactly. And that was not easy work. I mean, you spent three hours you know, a week on conference calls discussing, you know, how to, how to define a shipping container. I mean, it's like writing laws. For literally years, I'm sure. It was for years, yeah. yes. Yeah. But just the amount of knowledge that we gained from that and the connections we have. Now the CEO of the ICC is very involved with the Modular Building Institute as well. So we're talking about, United. You know, you're based here. Mm -hmm. 
what about around the rest of the world? Like, do you see, how, how is your company looking at geographic expansion? So our customer base is actually all over North America okay. already. And, you know, we get the question, how do you get containers up to Alaska? Or how do you get them to the Caribbean? How do you get them to Maine? How do you get them to California? And it's like, well, they're shipping containers. You put them on a boat. <laughs> you put them on a boat. You put them on a truck. A truck. They're, they're, there's an entire global train, infrastructure for moving our, our cargo around, right? So you just hop piggyback on the existing infrastructure to exactly. get it to where you need. And as long as we design it in a way where it's still compliant as a container, yeah, we can ship it anywhere. And so, you know, I've thought about, do we need a second factory location closer to the customer? Uh, and, 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 you know, back in 2013, I opened a Norfolk factory. Norfolk, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was probably one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my business career. Really? Right. Because I didn't understand how different the culture, the work culture is in Nor Norfolk compared to Austin. And we just didn't have enough executive well, who, DNA to who bring would have, over. No, you're an entrepreneur. You wouldn't have known that. <laughs> you're not supposed to learn that until after you do it once. Right. Ready, fire, aim, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you so, still have that location or did you? No. You you, you, you cut your losses. and We had to cut our losses. There were a lot of losses. Learned your mistakes. <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah. It was, it was pretty brutal. Wouldn't do that again. Unless we really have a team that can really start up new locations and take... Yeah. What's special about what's in Austin uh -huh. and take it there. So important. It's just too hard. So important. Yeah. Your culture's got to win. Culture's got to win. You got to get gonna the win. systems there. Yeah. Yeah. And and those employees mm -hmm. that were working somewhere else that are now working for you, if they're going to win with you, yes. culture's got to win. They've got it. Yeah. And if you think about how different Norfolk is than Austin. Yeah. Right. It's just a very, very different culture. Well, it's fascinating. I Like I said, you and I have crossed paths. So long ago, and I remember when I met you, and I was like, "You're doing what? <laughs> You've come a long way, man." Well, I appreciate really proud that. of you. So this year, you're celebrating 20 years. I mean, that's really amazing as a company. Your 20th anniversary. Congrats! Yeah, thank way you. Way to go. It's thank a long you. time. It is a long time. Um, what's been the <clears> biggest <throat> lesson you've learned from the past two decades of running your business? And it can be yeah. multiple things. It doesn't have to be one. You can talk about anything you want to talk about. I would say there, there are two important lessons. Um, one is it's all about the people, right? Unless you have a great team, it doesn't matter how great of an entrepreneur you are, how great of a salesperson, how great of a finance person, unless you've got the right team, you, you can't do anything, right? And, and to build that team is a lot harder than it looks. And keeping it together, actually, if it's working, is a lot easier than it looks. And so having that great team has just been so instrumental. I was talking to a young entrepreneur this morning. It's funny you mentioned that about the team. And he said, yeah, he said, we'll, we'll do that today. And, he go, and then his partner says, yeah, they, that's, that's your phrase, isn't it? And he said, yep, <laughs> do it today. Why wait till tomorrow if you can do it today? And, I, and, and he said that that's one of his mentors that just always told him it was all the successful people. He thought that was a ca characteristic that they all shared was just do yeah. it today. Do it yeah. now. Do Don't it wait. Now. Yeah. And I said, you know, that works really, really well. And you can be a miserable failure as an entrepreneur if you don't take care of your people and your customers. That's exactly right. So you can do it all you want all day long today. But if you don't take care of those employees. That's right. And that sounds like you learned that. Did you know that going into it or did you learn I it on the fly? Know. I had to learn that on the fly. Did you? And, you know, it's funny is that we think about you talk about partner like like my partner, Brian, and I've been together for 20 years. 20 years. And still, like every Monday today, we have lunch and we call it like our date night. Right? That's so hilarious. And we go out and we catch up and we talk about you know, the business, but we talk about- What's, what's Brian's last name? Derringer, like the gun. Brian Derringer. And you guys have been partners in this for 20 years. Yeah. So he's kind of, is so he's, is he the nuts and bolts, <laughs> get it done kind of guy on the partner? Here, here's how we put it. When we first started the business, he goes, hey, look, you create the problems- I'll solve them. There you go. I'm like, are you sure? Because uh -huh. I can create a mess. <laughs> I can make a huge uh -huh. mess. Hey, but... let's go to Norfolk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, let's build a container farm. Uh -huh. Let's right? do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I'm uh, I'm excited to get to share your story well, with you. our listeners. And um, before I end the podcast, um, I don't know if you have anything you want to ask about me or Keystone Bank, but I know that 
at Keystone, we're very excited to be banking you again. Yeah. We uh, started banking together at my last bank. That That's right. A little hiatus until we started this one. And now we're back together again. And I just want you to know how thrilled I am that that's happening. Definitely. We're excited to be partnered with you again on that. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions for me, but if not, I'm going to end the podcast by asking you one simple question. And that is, what is the, you know, what is the one best or most worthwhile investment that you've ever made? Well, I would have to say, you know, a lot of people look at where we're located and we call it area 51 because it's 51 acres right off of state highway 130. Perfect. And you could call it lucky, right? But it was just part of the business plan is we needed space. And so we needed to buy some land. And we, when we bought it, State Highway 130 was first constructed and no traffic or anything out that way. And it just gave us a lot of room to expand and do whatever we wanted to do. Had way too many acres out there and we'd use the back for shooting guns and things like that. But as Austin's grown, Tesla decided to move next to us and all that. I mean, it's just been a phenomenal investment for us. And would have never thought about doing that if it wasn't. And you needed business. it anyway. And we needed it anyway. It has been fantastic. Planning ahead, great, smart financial yeah. business decision. So maybe it was luck. <laughs> we don't. I don't know. think so. You, <laughs> but yeah, I like to say that when I, I like to say that about that. You know, well, it's. I'd rather be lucky than good. Yeah. And then people look at you and go, "Well, you create your own luck. You create your own luck." But I will say this, Jeff. That that's the best financial investment. I would say, the single best investment period was choosing to invest in the Austin community as far as just getting out there, meeting guys like you, really building that network. Not networking, like too many people say, but really investing in relationships and getting to know people really well. You've done that well. Yeah. And, and I and think that that, that is, is I, I, I love that about, I love that answer. Yeah. Uh, I wish Austin's more people cool, would Austin's cool, isn't it? It is. It's a really cool place to invest in yes. others. Yes. that are in the same boat that you're in. And it's open, right? People are it so It feels like to it to me. Yeah. Uh, so you've been at this 20 years and you're here before then. You went to school here. Yeah. I got here in 2005. There you go. And had spent some time in the Midwest. And, you know, those those big cities in the Midwest are pretty parochial. I mean, they it's, are. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not super open. Yeah. Austin just feels really good. Yeah. It so feels, I, feels right. And as you talk to young entrepreneurs, a lot of them get lost in, oh, I've got to develop the perfect source code or whatever it is. It's like, no, get out and meet people and connect, right? Yeah, I think that's, a, I love that about this community and you mm -hmm. can do that. We used, we did that a lot at EO. We did. I mean, that's and why we're sitting here together. People, right? you, people would sit in the EO forums and they'd have a banking thing and they'd, well, just call Jeff. He's a, he's an EO member and he'll give you his opinion. And I called you back then and that's when you helped me, right? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. And that's how I wound up here today. We just helped each other out. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Uh, fascinating story. Not too many people get to do what you're doing by having been a successful entrepreneur for 20 years in the same business. Wow. So can't thank wait you. to see what the next 20 years looks like. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for joining Banking on Community from Austin, Texas. Today's episode gave you an aha moment. Would you let us know? We'd love to hear from you. You can come into one of our branches and share with us what you loved about today's conversation or reach out to us on social media. Community banking is about solving problems, not just for customers, but for neighbors. If you know someone in our community that would benefit from this conversation, please share this podcast with them.